Hi, my name is Chris Fowler, and I'm one of the members here at Desert Grace. We have a great message for you today. If you enjoy this video, be sure to give us a thumbs up and leave a comment so we know that you've been here and been blessed. Thank you and God bless. Some, uh, sometimes when I'm trying to figure out what to where, where a series is going and, and what God is calling us to do or calling us to be, I, I, I'm reminded of stories and I think, well, you know, I don't know if that one goes or that one doesn't go or if it fits with this particular one. And so sometimes at the last kind of minute, God speaks and says, here's what I want you to do. And so we find ourselves again in Acts chapter 9. But before we get too deep in here, I want to talk a little bit about a concept that is called semiotics. Have you ever heard of this? It, it basically, it suggests that there is a signifier and then there is the signified. In other words, that for basically everything that we know, there is a word or an icon or a phrase or a sign or a symbol that tells us what an object is or what, uh, what's going on or, or what might be happening here and there. So technically, semiotics is the study of signs and symbols and how they are used and interpreted. And for some things, it deals a lot with language, linguistics, and in other things, they're more universal. There's some signs that we would all know simply by looking at it. One of the, the things that really gets us about signs is that most signifiers, in the language in particular, are arbitrary. They do not necessarily match the item that they describe. So there's really no reference. It is what it is because we have decided that this is the symbol or the word that means whatever it means. So I'm going to give you a picture of an object. And my guess is you'll immediately be able to tell me what symbol we use to describe this object. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a trick question, that's a house. And if I were to say, you know, there's a house that's at the end of the street, and that's the house that you want to go to for the party. You have in your mind already what a house looks like. And now your house may look different from my house, and what you immediately think of when you hear the word house might be different from what I immediately think of when I hear the word house. It, it's not really important because if I tell you that I left something at the house, you know what I'm talking about. Whether you know where my house is or what it looks like or not, you know what I'm speaking of. It's just a symbol. It has nothing to do. House means house because we decided it means house. Here is another thing. Evil. Cats, right? The letters put together, C-A-T, mean this animal that you're seeing on the screen. And just like everything else, it could be looking like this in your mind. It could look like something else. Maybe you've had a cat once. Maybe you didn't have a cat once. Uh, the fact that they're evil is not that important. <laughs> you say cat, and this is what you see. Here's another symbol. It's a traffic light, right? But we're going to go a step further. When it's red, now I realize on this one they're all lit, but when it's red, what does that mean? When it's green. And yellow means go even faster, right? <laughs> But do you understand that red has nothing to do with stopping other than that's what we decided? And green has nothing to do with going except for that's what we decided? And yellow is open to interpretation apparently. 
Sometimes you're out and about, you want a particular kind of place, you see a symbol like this and you immediately know what it means. Anybody still struggling with this one? We have decided that this symbol is the universal symbol in almost any language of a place where you can use the restroom. That, that's basically a symbol. So now you're getting the idea, right? Everything that we say, no matter what it is, seems to have a, a, a signal that it is part of it. One of the issues is that some of the things that are signs are naturally occurring phenomenon. And so semiotics actually looks at this as well. So if you see smoke, what do you assume? See, you guys have this down. You know exactly what we're talking about today. It is so important that we recognize that for the most part, smoke and fire, we kind of can put together real easy, but house and the building or a cat, anyway. Here's the thing. Names as a sign or a symbol, sometimes it just says, okay, this person is this, but oftentimes they tend to have a descriptive meaning. So much so that sometimes people, when they're naming their children, pick a name, hoping that that child will live up into a, another person with a similar name that they know that maybe was powerful or, or great. So I thought this would be a lot of fun. We could talk about the meaning of names. And so I looked up my wife's name, Carissa, and found that it means beloved or beloved and grace. And I said, absolutely. This is fun. So I looked up my own name, and I'm assuming that it was going to say something absolutely wonderful. <laughs> like powerful, smart. It means fenced settlement. <laughs> I'm not sure what to do with that, but I have discovered this. We tend to equate certain names with certain personalities, whether we realize it or not. That somebody with a particular name is, is going to have a particular personality. And what they have discovered is like if something happens really, uh, somebody becomes famous. Like, you know, there's this guy named Clint Eastwood and the, the people naming their children Clint went way high. There's other times when, when there's been issues where somebody has maybe committed a major crime and that first name starts to really fall because we don't want our kids to be like that. I've also noticed that sometimes a name just doesn't seem to fit. Like somebody looks like they belong to a different name. Do you ever have people like that? Like every time you see them, their name, like you, you want to call them something else. Some people just give up on that, that urge and so they just nickname you, right? So instead of calling you by your name, they call you by something else. And sometimes people earn their nicknames. Sometimes nicknames are rather ironic, like when a really big guy is named Tiny. <laughs> With all that in mind, my question really is, what do we learn from Barnabas' cross? What do we begin to understand about the cross of Jesus even when we begin to recognize who Barnabas is and, and everything that we know about him? In case you're not really familiar with Barnabas, you may know him by his real given name, which is Joseph the Levite. No. Uh, that's how he is introduced in chapter 4 of Acts. He basically, we are told that Barnabas is a guy that was named Joseph. He was a Levite from Cyprus, which is an island. And so this is our introduction. We get the impression that he's an actually quite prominent member of the early church. He seems to know all of the apostles. And part of what we know is that the apostles gave him the name Barnabas. 
It's a nickname for him given to him by the apostles. So, so he was very prominent. He was somebody who was, who was quite a part of it. We also know that he must have been kind of a wealthy person. At least he had some means because in that first introduction to him, basically what we are told is that he goes and sells a field or a tract of land and brings the money to the apostles. And if you know your Bible really well, you know this happens right before Ananias and Sapphira, who lied about how much money they bring. So you kind of have, here's Barnabas really doing the right thing and showing what it means and being a prominent member of the church and all of this, and even getting a nickname from the, from the, the disciples and Ananias and Sapphira kind of being pretenders following them. The meaning of Barnabas is son of encouragement. And when you think about that, it tells us a lot about what others thought about Joseph the Levite. I want you to remember this for just a minute. We generally aren't very good at giving ourselves nicknames. Other people give us nicknames that stick. If you were going to pick your own nickname... It might be one of those situations where other people would go, yeah, you know, I don't know if that fits you. Hmm. But the fact that the apostles called him Barnabas, son of encouragement, tells us a lot about what they thought. It's hard for us to know what all the ways that Barnabas became an encourager to the, to the apostles specifically and to the other people around him, but we do know of a few, obviously the selling of the field being one of them. But that's not really the important part. Clearly, it was true because the apostles had nicknamed this one person that name, Son of Encouragement. We get a, a taste a little bit about what this encouragement is like when we get to Acts chapter 9. Barnabas kind of disappears after chapter 4, reappears here. And so let's go ahead and read our passage. We're going to go Acts chapter 9, verses 23 through 31. It says this, After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a wall in the basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him, not believing he was really a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on a journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how, Dam uh, how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them, and he moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about Saul, and again, I may use Paul or Saul. I'm trying to be consistent with Saul, but you know, he's the same guy. But he begins this transformation as he's on the road to Damascus, ready to kill Christians. So on his way, he gets there. This transformation puts him in a position of distrust by everyone. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a position where, where you were the one who was persecuting others which would only make one group of people upset or fearful of you. But now you have Paul who ends up finding his way to be distrusted by everyone in Damascus to a certain degree. At first, you might remember Ananias. We just talked about him last week. He distrusted Saul when God said, hey, go and put your hands on him. Ananias says, hey, Lord, um... You know that guy was coming to kill people like me? Like he was the archenemy? 
So you have Ananias being really upset. What do you think happened with the rest of the Christ followers in Damascus? Do you think they said, oh, well, it's Paul. They've all heard what he was coming to do. We'll just trust him. Uh, no, probably not. It probably took a while, and, and by the way, Ananias probably had a hand in that. I mean, it's not stated in the scripture, but he might have done the exact sort of same thing that Barnabas did and said, hey, you guys, God told me to come heal him, and I healed him, and look, he's preaching boldly the name of Jesus. He really has been transformed. And so you have kind of an issue there. Then we get on, there's a little bit that I hadn't read, and you realize that Saul gets to Damascus, all of this stuff has happened to him on the way and at the beginning, and what Saul is actually doing in Damascus is not persecuting Christians, he is preaching the word and getting converts. The exact thing he was against just before. And in fact, you find out that that doesn't turn out very well because when he's doing all of this, what he ends up doing is confusing all of the Jews, the religious Jews that had been in there. Here is this Paul who we've heard so many wonderful things about who is now proclaiming the way. That's kind of a scary thing for us. It makes us uncomfortable. It makes us a little worried, right? So if Jews, being baffled by what Paul is doing or Saul is doing in there, they basically begin to decide that he is the arch enemy. That the arch enemy to Christians has now become the arch enemy to the Damascus Jews. In other words, the people he was coming to hunt, essentially, he now has become the hunted by the group of people he used to be a part of. This has got to be a rough and confusing moment for anybody. Trying to do the right thing, feeling like God has called you to do something absolutely important. Saul ends up having to watch out for the Jewish and, and probably the Jewish leaders have already gotten the government leaders involved and, and the scripture tells us that they were waiting for him at the gates. They were watching and so Saul has to be careful where he goes, where he moves about, what he's doing, what he's saying because at any moment if they capture him he would have a fate that would end his ministry. In fact, we read that the things were so bad that they had to basically smuggle Paul out of the city in the middle of the night through an opening in the wall. Interesting. The guy that came with all the power and authority now is being snuck away. I want to kind of do a side note here because this is one of the parts in the Bible where when I have read it, so often I have read it in such simple sequential order that I don't stop and think about how much time has elapsed. How long do you think Saul was in Damascus? I'll give you a hint. The scripture a couple of times says three days. Three days before he is healed, and then another three days, and then it says, after some time. After some time. Kind of an interesting thing. The scholars look at notes, and, and the reality is we have no idea, but one of the hints that we have is that he was there for up to three years. Three years. Anyway, he escapes to Jerusalem to find that Christians don't trust him. They're not sure if his claims of having joined the way are true or whether he's simply kind of trying to, to infiltrate their ranks so that he could have more access to them to, to kill them or persecute them. And about this time, you might start to feel a little sorry for poor Saul, right? He knew exactly what he wanted to do. He thought he was doing exactly what God wanted. He's on his way to Damascus to fulfill the mission he feels God has put him on. God stops him midway, blinds him for three days. He's there. He's getting weak and, and not the strong person he once was. God sends somebody to heal him. And then he finally gets to the point where he can preach Jesus, starts going out and preaching Jesus, and then he gets run out of town. 
gets into the new town and says, hey, Jerusalem Christians, I want to be a part of your church. I have been, I've been changed. I'm a different guy than I was, than you knew before. And basically they say, um, Saul, um, you know, Jesus says we're supposed to love our enemy like our neighbor and all that kind of stuff, but we're not so sure about you. Now, this is not what the Bible says. This is what I'm thinking it would say if it really went into this, right? It doesn't really say it. It just says he wasn't really accepted. What Saul really wanted so much was to be associated, to be accepted by the Jews. He wanted to be alongside them preaching the gospel is what he really wanted. And they're saying, um, remember Stephen and what you did then? Do you remember why you went to, to Damascus? My guess is that they didn't want to have anything to do with him. Which reminds me of something. Do you remember Ananias? Who kind of told God, oh yes, I'd love to go put my hands on anybody. Um, that one, are you sure? They're kind of doing the same thing. Only now, rather than healing him, they're kind of like, I'm not sure. We're going to hold you at arm's length uh, until we can figure out what's going on. So Saul gets encouragement from Joseph the Levite, who's called Barnabas. He encourages the believers to accept Saul. It's interesting because... There's no record of Barnabas having been there when this whole thing went down. He must know because he was open enough to hear the story. I mean, that's the only thing I can figure out. That's the only thing I think would make any sense. But Barnabas basically takes Saul to the apostles and basically paints the picture for the apostles so that they would see that this transformation from Saul, this evil trying to kill all the Christians in Jesus or in God's name, to now he's preaching Jesus' name legitimately. Barnabas reframes all of this in a sense. So that when he's telling the story, the people hearing will know that God is the actor, that God is the one who validates this. Not necessarily Barnabas, but God himself is the one who's doing the work. He says things like, Saul saw the Lord. Now, if you have convincingly saw the Lord and you've been transformed because of it, there's no doubt that God had a hand in your life. You, you can't really deny that. You can't really be uh, against that. Second thing is that Saul heard the Lord. You remember that, right? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you? And finally, Saul was boldly preaching Jesus throughout Damascus. This is evidence that God is involved. My guess is that the apostles, to a certain extent, could see their own experience in this. We saw Jesus. We heard everything he had to say, and now we are in the position of boldly preaching. Saul ultimately does get accepted in Jerusalem, and he begins to boldly proclaim, to boldly preach Jesus once again. This is the part where you go, yes! Everything's the way it's supposed to be. Once again, he couldn't preach in Damascus because everything's going on. But now in Jerusalem, he'll be able to preach. He's going to be able to move around freely. He's able to, to go and, and teach. This is exciting. You're not very excited at all. Everything seems to be exactly the way it's supposed to be. And so, really, here's one of the challenges. Jerusalem was where Paul began his journey against Christ, likely with the Hellenistic Jews. Now, we see the Hellenistic Jews being spoken of again in this passage. Hellenistic Jews basically were Greek-speaking Jews. They're, they're, they're basically the, the, the same people that were most likely the ones who were there with Paul when Stephen was stoned. 
uh, that they were probably the, the ones that were really pushing all of this with Paul standing there going, huh, this is good stuff, let me hold your coat. Now, no chance of anything going wrong, right? Saul's moving back and forth. He's preaching. What could possibly happen? What happens is the same cycle repeats. The Christians finally accept Saul, but guess who doesn't accept him? His Hellenistic Jew friends who, when they were arguing with Stephen over who Jesus was, stoned him to death. Now Paul, Saul, the one who was with them, is arguing Stephen's point. We expect this to end any differently? No, of course not. In a sense, Saul's again rescued. Not sure how long he spent in Jerusalem, but, but he escapes this threat in Jerusalem, and he is taken to Caesarea and then on to his hometown of Tarsus. It's an interesting kind of thing, because we're talking a little bit about Barnabas, but, but we're also seeing what's going on with Saul. And Saul being the encourager. Come on, you guys, we need to accept this guy. Barnabas wants everything else, and so it seems so fitting to me that the scripture closes with this statement about how the church entered a, a time of peace and growth, and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it grew in numbers as well. In a sense, what it's saying is those who are encouragers are being led by the Holy Spirit to ensure that God's work is being done in the world. Think about that for a minute. Think about how important that might be for you and for me. Barnabas continues to be a very important figure in the Jerusalem church. All right, so he brings Paul in. He's given all this money. We know that he's given a nickname, son of encouragement, the one who's really kind of always there for you. And they find out that there's some incredible things going on in Antioch. And they say, hey, we need to send somebody down to Antioch. Find out what's going on with the new Christians there. You'll never guess who they sent. That's right, Barnabas. And they send him down to see what's going on. And in fact, here's what they say about him in the midst of that story. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great many people were brought to the Lord. You're kind of starting to like Joseph the Levite, aren't you? If you didn't know him as that before, now you do. There you go. But what about Saul? Because that's how this whole story begins. Barnabas and Saul reunite in Antioch. They come back together. In fact, what the scripture says is that Barnabas sends for Paul, for Saul. He goes and he gets him and he brings him back so that they could be together in ministry. Is there anything more encouraging than sending for somebody and coming alongside them and working together? Yeah, the answer is no, but that's all right. You guys are all looking at me like, I don't know, is there? Ends up that Barnabas and Saul spend a whole year together in Antioch. And the scripture gives us this little parenthetical kind of thing that says, by the way, in Antioch is where the Christians were first called Christians. This is where it was. This is where the disciples were first named Christians. After that year is over, Barnabas and Saul seeing this church growing, and, and my guess is they were so excited and so thrilled with what God was doing. And the leaders of the church in Antioch, it says there were some, some prophets and some people who were hearing from God, and basically they said, send Barnabas and Saul on a mission. So the leaders of the church send them on a mission to go and tell people about Jesus, the encourager and probably one of the most um, zealous people we know are together on the road. This is exciting, right? Yeah. Some of you guys are just not with this. I'm like, come on. This is exciting stuff. Could you imagine being on that road trip? 
They hop in the church van, turn the radio up, drive as fast as they can down the hill to see who gets the throw up first. There's even a little note that they say Bar they take Barnabas' cousin, John Mark, as a helper. They need help. Someone's got to set up all the sound equipment and the video projector and run. I'm just trying to make sure y'all are still paying attention. Mission to the Gentiles is a great success. They talk to some Jews in the midst of that, and basically the Jews aren't really interested in hearing what they have to say. That's neither here nor there. But the Gentiles really love this message. And, and during the course of this, at some point, John Mark heads back to Jerusalem, basically abandoning the vision. The van was not so much fun after that, uh, I guess. We know that Saul and Barnabas ultimately disagree and separate. That first mission that they are sent out on where John Mark has gone and, and everything has happened, they come back from that. And then Saul says, hey, listen, that was so much fun. Let's go back and retrace our steps and say hello to everybody. And Barnabas says, well, that would be a whole lot of fun. Oh, let me go get John Mark packed. And Paul says, no. Uh -uh. He left us the first time, and I'm not really comfortable with that. And, and honestly, one of the craziest things about this is it's the last time the activity of Barnabas or Joseph the Levite is recorded in Acts. That essentially, while he most likely didn't just stop being the encourager and the person that he was, it's the last time we hear about him. The story really centers more on, on Paul anyway. I've wondered often if this separation was the result of more encouragement. If John Mark was the one who Barnabas was trying to encourage and Saul, who had once been encouraged or been the subject of the encouragement, wasn't willing to let this one go. I'm not exactly sure. I'm not exactly what it's all about. But it's sad to me that this is where Barnabas' story seems to end for us. My question I asked you before was, what do we learn from Barnabas's cross. What kind of things do we really understand from, from what we've been talking about? I'll come to a couple of conclusions. The first thing is, is that encouragement in community is life-giving. In case you didn't catch that, for Saul, it was literally giving him the breath he needed to continue to minister. Here's the thing. You may not naturally be a Barnabas. You might not naturally be somebody who comes alongside and encourages, but I think for all of us, there is a requirement for us because not only do we need to be willing to encourage one another in whatever way we can, we cannot do this alone. There is nothing that happens if I came this morning to preach and no one is sitting here and no one is logging in online and no one is being a part of what I'm doing. There is no sense in anything that I'm doing. And yet when we gather together, our mere presence together, whether it's in this room, whether it is online, whether it's at 1030 on a Sunday morning or whether it's sometime during the week, because we have people who are listening all the time. No matter what, it has meaning because we do it together. 
thought about this, and John 13, 35 tells us that the followers of Christ, the, the disciples should be known by their love for one another. How could you be an encourager? In Saul's particular case, he really needed Barnabas to go with him so that he could be accepted into the community. I thought about that, and I thought there's probably some people in our own community who need you to walk alongside them and bring them into the fellowship of what we're doing. Whether it's that they're worried we wouldn't accept them because of whatever they've done. So many people I've talked to, and I say, hey, you want to come to church? They're like, oh, the doors would fall down if I walked in there. I want to say, well, you know, stay away from the doors that are kind of broken in the one building, but the other ones are fine. People way worse than you have stepped foot in a church, and the building doesn't catch fire. What would happen if we all realized that we are, to a certain extent, be a Barnabas? Hmm. I'm convinced that we are called to encourage one another, much like Barnabas seemed to encourage everyone around him. I, I don't know how much you understand this, but there is something to be said for the fact that at the end of the month, we can pay our bills. And I don't care if you gave a dollar or you gave a million dollars. Well, if you're giving a million dollars, I'd love to know that. But if you gave a dollar or you gave a huge sum of money, it doesn't really matter. That dollar is just as encouraging as the $10,000. Because it's us. So Barnabas sells a field so that the apostles have some money to do the ministry that God has called them to do. How encouraging is that? He is willing to bring the one who everyone's afraid of and say, look, God has done something in his life. My guess is Barnabas did an awful lot of discipling, and we know he did a lot of preaching. We can encourage by giving to the cause. We can encourage by advocating for new Christians. We can encourage by discipling one another and those that are around. This is where the rubber hits the, the road. Are you an encourager? Are you an encourager? I have a second question for you. Are you being encouraged by other Christ followers? I want to kind of like read into the scripture for just a minute. Barnabas advocates and encourages Saul. Saul's success most certainly would have fed back into Barnabas, right? Like if I want to see you really succeed and I'm speaking into your life and God is doing something incredible in your life and I see you get blessed, guess who else gets blessed? Are you being encouraged by others? My curiosity in this is a little bit, if you're not, are you truly engaged with other Christians? Or are you not? You see, the problem is you can't go it alone. You might be able to encourage one other person if you're trying to be the Lone Ranger Christian. You will not be encouraged back. You have to be engaged in the community. The second thing I think we learn is that m really salvation, the fact that God has worked in our life and transformed us, it has to be lived out in tangible and missional ways. When you think about Barnabas, he is living out the salvation that he's received. Encouraging. He's preaching. He's going with Saul all around. He's sent by the church in Jerusalem to Antioch to find out if everything is going well and to help teach and disciple. My guess is that he is probably one of the great examples in all of the Bible of somebody who's really interested in what God wants. 
Hmm. Anyone who has encountered Christ and has had a change in their heart and a change in their very being and change in their status from being lost to being saved, from being lost to being found, hey, when your nature is no longer just to go out and sin all the time, hey, it should be obvious to the world around you. My concern is that sometimes in the American church we've lost track of this. Turn it into something more like a country club. A place where we come in and we shake hands and we say, oh, great Sunday. And then we walk out as though it meant nothing. Barnabas lived out his salvation by generous encouragement, bold preaching. He encouraged as many people as he could to accept Christ. Now, I'm going to tell you, I've already mentioned, I'm not so sure that I'm the best encourager. That's not in my natural sense, I don't think. I don't know if I'm really that bold in introducing people to Christ. I, you know, I do pretty well in this place because I'm pretty comfortable, but put me out like on a street corner and I'd probably really be bad. <laughs> Saul, he also lived out his salvation with, with a bold leadership. I, I'm not sure Saul would have been that surprised when people wanted to start killing him. He knew how those people thought. He knew what they were going to say or what they were going to do. He said, what I've experienced is so much more important that I must preach even if it means that my own life goes away. He says things like that later on. How are you living out your salvation? If God has changed you, how does that affect your everyday life? I would put both Barnabas and Saul in the, in the realm of vocational preachers or, or religious folk. So I'm not saying that if you really have been transformed, leave your job and go preach. what I'm telling you is your life ought to be preaching for you no matter what you're doing. I don't know what name people call you. Apparently people call me a fenced settlement. I was just hoping for something more cool than that. <laughs> but when you are transformed by God, he gives you a nickname. You're a Christian. You're a Christ follower. A little Jesus. Are you living into that? If you're living into it, are you trying to live into your impact, what Christ wants you to do by yourself? Or are you entered into the community of believers, in this particular case, Desert Grace? Or are you kind of out on your own? Or are you out on your own? True transformation is lived out only when we can encourage one another and live into what God called us to do. And in case you missed it, God has a calling on your life. There is no other option. God has called you. Is your cross encouraging?
we've thought about mercy and we've thought about all the different things and the, the significant transformation and the, and the obedience and so many other things, but what about encouraging? My challenge for you, I want to make sure we're clear, my challenge for you is not just merely that you're like slapping people on the back and saying, good job, go get them. My challenge for you is really to be more engaged in the life of the church. And by the way, I do mean this church, but I don't mean this church. I mean God's church. This is just one representation of it. If this is where you're going to attend, well, then you better dive in because this is where you're going to encourage. But then you can also spread some of that around. This is tough stuff, I think. So one of the kids said something on there, I think it was Emma, said something like, there are consequences to becoming a Christ follower. My concern for us is too often we live like there aren't. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this idea of being an encourager and having a cross that really encourages those around us, no matter what's going on, no matter what's distracting us, no matter what might be getting in our way, or what, no matter what our excuse is, Lord, we would ask that you would be speaking into our lives in the areas where we so desperately need to be better at being encouragers. Lord, we love you. For those of us that have truly given our life completely over to you, who have said, yes, Lord, you are going to be my savior. Our lives should have been transformed in that very moment. And now we should be living out that salvation in ways that people can see around us. That in and of itself would be such an incredible encouragement to others. So, Lord, if there's anyone, first off, who hasn't yet accepted you as their Savior, may this be the moment that they say, I will follow Christ. And, Lord, if there is anyone in this room who's feeling like they are not the encourager you've called them to be, may this be the moment in which they say, Lord, I give my life completely to you so that I can be the type of encourager in the community and in the, in the world around me the way you've called me to do it. Lord, I can't pray enough for the kids who are going to go to camp, for the kids that are going to be in the world quiz and, and be discussing things about you. Grab a hold of their lives and may these moments be an encouragement to them as well that they would come back with wonderful reports about how you've moved in their midst. Keep us safe throughout this week. Bring us back together that we would be able to worship you again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for watching this message with me. If you want to see more, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the little bell to be notified when we go live or post a new video. We'd also like to invite you to join us in the person for a service. Visit us at desertgrace.org or give us a call at 928-305-1132 for more information.